He's dead. I... Oh, who had the gun? I did. Then you shot him. I didn't. Well, you had the gun. If you didn't shoot him, who did? Everyone and their mother seem to at least know of the film Clue. Well, everyone knows of the board game. Was it a crazy idea to make a movie out of a game? These days, it's pretty common. But back in 1985, it was unheard of and people were skeptical before it even started shooting. With talk of a new movie version of the board game, including some of it from Ryan Reynolds, now is the perfect time to take a look at what the f happened to this horror movie. The film is one that surprised people back in the day for being based on a board game and for the fairly numerous negative reviews. It has an amazing cast, a great sense of humor, and talented behind the scenes folks. Even Roger Ebert, who gave a chance to many movies other reviewers didn't even look at at the time, said that, quote, fun, I must say, is in short supply clearly showing that the entire proceedings did not entertain him. Audiences at the time seemed to agree with him, and only a rare few saw the movie. Made on a budget of 15 million US, the film only brought in 14.6 million US, which makes it a minor flop. Granted, other costs come into play here, but the film also made a bit more money on home video later on, so this is an almost break-even situation, but still listed as a flop especially considering the cast filled with name actors and people who brought in lots of butts to seats normally. So where did things go wrong? Well, it's a mix of the film feeling like a fish out of water back in the day, the bad reviews, and audiences just not connecting. The movie itself is highly entertaining and has since become a cult classic for fans of comedies, whodunits, Tim Curry, and Clue. It's the kind of film that could only have been made in 1985 and yet was not made for 1985. I want to thank you guys for watching What the F*** Happened to This Horror Movie and ask that if you enjoy our shows, please subscribe to our channel right now, like this video, and click on the bell so you can be notified each time a new video goes up. And now, back to the show. There's been a murder! Always oh, there he is. It's a classic game of Clue. Who done it, where they done it, and with which weapon they uh, done it with. Now, who created this masterpiece of insanity? The film here is written by John Landis, Jonathan Lynn, and Anthony E. Pratt, with Jonathan Lynn directing. The movie itself is actually a decent adaptation of a game where the denouement changes with each time you play, something they tried to do in cinematic form, having multiple different endings being filmed, three of which were playing in theaters in an attempt to push the public to go see it three times. This led to some audience frustration and to critics really hating the gimmick. If we know that walking into the movie, then we really can't get too excited about guessing who done it because, think about it, literally anybody could have done it and anybody did do it. It was hard to know which ending you'd get in theaters and some folks were clearly not into it. Each ending has some variations on who did it and all worked in basically the same way. A fourth ending was at least partially filmed where Wadsworth goes and admits to the murders and to those of his captive audience by way of poison. This ending is not one that can be found now. In each of the released endings, Wadsworth admits to different identities as to who he really is. There is a lot in there, and these elements clearly only led to complicating the relationship with the audience and pushing them to not necessarily want to see all three endings. All right, who done it? He did. Oh, that one later on. Right? Uh, right. I I I they all did it. But also not care about the fact that there were three endings. To make it even easier, probably be best if you didn't go to this movie at all. At this point, ending C, the third ending, is the one generally seen as the real ending of the film. This is the one where Wadsworth admits to really being Mr. Body and being the one inviting them all to this little event. The other two endings have been viewed at this point as being mere suggestions. While this creates a bit of a mess, it honestly matches the game itself where players can attempt to elucidate the murder with the clues they have gathered. If one played is incorrect, the game keeps going and other endings are suggested until the true ending is found. So in true clue fashion, some folks got frustrated with these multiple endings so things were simplified for the home video release. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm instructed to explain to you what you all have in common with each other. You're all being blackmailed. Film fans were still curious, and the cast here is something else. So clearly, they brought a few people to theaters to see their new film. Top billing here goes to the extremely talented Tim Curry, as the butler receiving everyone in the manor and telling them why they are there and explaining everything. I'm Wadsworth, sir. The butler. Curry does amazing work using his accent, his talent, and his charisma to make this character the central one in a bunch of memorable actors and parts. Working with him here are Eileen Brennanen, Madeline Kahn, Christopher Lloyd, Michael McKean, Martin Mull, Leslie Ann Warren, Jane Weedlin, and of course, the punk god himself, Lee Ving. 
from the pioneer band Fear. Can I get a one, two, three, four for old time's sake? One, two, three, four! With such a great cast, it's a wonder more people didn't show up against the critics. That being said, part played by Leslie Ann Warren was supposed to be played by Carrie Fisher, and one can only wonder what that would have been like and what it would have changed in the film and for the film especially since she was coming right off Star Wars at the time. But her battle with drugs landed her in rehab, and the insurance company for the production decided she was too high of a risk and her part had to be recast. Which is quite interesting when it is now known that Eileen Brennanen was freshly out of rehab for a painkiller addiction herself. Oh, please, I've never heard anything so ridiculous. Now, watching the film, one can hardly imagine anyone else in either parts. So it worked out in the end. While the game doesn't have a clear story, there is something these that made Jonathan Lynn curious when he was hired to write this for director John Landis and producer Deborah Hill. Yes, that Deborah Hill. Fans of murder mystery can easily see about a thousand stories that could be made to connect with Clue, but the fact that the film was written to be limited to one location, inside a manor, and with only the characters in the game and a rare few more, is something that most writers would have found limiting. Now, to those who have seen the film, it both makes sense and doesn't make any sense. There is so much going on, so many characters, so many ways things could go, yet it works. Of course, the viewer needs to pay attention to follow and be open to the fact that they miss something when the ending comes and the butler Wadsworth explains everything. And that's part of the way the game feels. So why not have the film feel the same way? Here, the scenes all take place on a set, except for the ballroom, which was in a house in Pasadena for some reason, and the set was built to be the exact same way as the game board, including the secret passageways that led from one room to the other. There's a ton in there, and all the characters have a lot going on, so it's easy for anyone watching to get truly lost in the story. Not helping here is that Lannis himself saw the film as a farce of sorts, something he'd been pitching for so long, he saw it as something that was going to be just right. Of course, Others had been involved in previous incarnations of the script for Clue, including Tom Stoppard, who, according to Landis, gave up, paid back his salary, and completely forgot he ever worked on it. Then Stephen Sondheim, of all people, was approached for this, and later was unavailable for comment. So his take, or his approach to being involved, or not, is something he sadly took with him. A bunch more writers later, Landis got Lynn involved. Thoroughly traumatized the sweet-natured man with an insane pitch session, which some say included climbing on furniture, running around, and a lot of excited shouting. And he got him to say yes. The rest, as they say, is history. Director Jonathan Lynn is a man of comedy, and has done other films that have become either favorites or cult classics, including My Cousin Vinny, The Whole Nine Yards, and The Fighting Temptations. He's one who isn't shy to take on complex films and take a few risks here and there, some paying off better than others. After being made director of Clue, he doubted he could do it, and even tried to back out of it as he considered some of the characters to just be colors and not humans who deserved to be put on film. At the urging of his agent, he stuck around, made some changes, and powered on. He has also said in interviews that he made the majority of the casting decisions based on actors suggested by the casting department, the final decisions coming down to him. This means that while many were suggested to play the maid, including Madonna, Jennifer Jason Lee and Demi Moore, he settled on Colleen Camp. And while there is no question that she could play the part, different versions of why she was hired are floating around, with Lynn both admitting that her cleavage helped and denying it completely. As for the selection of Tim Curry as Wadworth the butler, at the center of everything, the original choice made by Lynn was for Leonard Rossiter, who unfortunately passed away just before the film could go into pre-production. Then, Lynn almost went with Rowan Atkinson, who while incredibly talented and funny, would definitely have brought a different kind of energy. The final choice of Tim Curry is one that is absolutely perfect and pretty much impossible to imagine anyone else in the part. Being that director Lynn has known him forever only made it make even more sense as a choice. Curry, of course, was already a cult favorite from the Rocky Horror Picture Show. Now, when filming this, there were four or six ending shots, depending on who was talking about it, and that clearly must have messed with some of the folks involved. But if that were the case, they didn't let it show. There are even a few ad-lib scenes here, including a whole sequence where Madeline Kahn's Mrs. White talks about, quote, Flame, flames, flames, on the side of my face, breathing, breath, heaving breaths. That was all Kahn. And it comes off a bit off, to say the least, but not fully out of character, so it kind of works. <laughs> Following the film's theatrical failure, some claimed it was due to the multiple endings being shown as ending A, B, and C, but not clearly indicated for reviewers, so it was hard to tell which version to go see, while others blamed specific parties for the failure. 
Director Jonathan Lynn took the brunt of the hit, his career going into a sort of Hollywood jail for years, allowing him only limited work as a director. He eventually clearly bounced back with My Cousin Vinny and made a full comeback after that, which was a commercial hit, and is still quite beloved. Did you say Utes? Yeah, two Utes. What is a Ute? The cast, in most cases, had no issue bouncing back. Considering Christopher Lloyd had Back to the Future in the pipeline as Clue was being filmed, his career was safe. Tim Curry has had a long and illustrious career, playing everyone from Darkness to Pennywise, to an unsub on Criminal Minds, to voicing characters on Star Wars, The Clone Wars, and so much more. Madeline Kahn went on to do more comedies, TV shows, and voice work for kids' entertainment. <laughs> These are just three of the cast, and the rest of them all seem to have done at least well post-Clue. So really, only the director seems to have taken punishment for the failings of the film. Fans of Clue are passionate about the film, loving it dearly and defending it from all detractors. It has proper cult film status these days, and while not everyone has seen it, pretty much everyone has at least heard of it. It's the kind of film that feels like a Scooby-Doo episode for grown-ups including a mystery, people being blamed for others, and even a chase scene in the manor going from room to room with musical accompaniment. The film comes off a bit nuts, and that's part of its charm. It is just about the best cast one could dream up, and it actually adapts the board game while keeping its spirit. It's the kind of movie that needs to be experienced and seen possibly with friends, maybe with a drink. It's the kind of movie that requires a few viewings to catch all the details stuffed in there from the set design, the manor setup, the secret passageways, to the tiling in the hallways, the weapons used, the names in place, and so much more. This is the kind of movie that warrants owning it on disc and deserves multiple viewings.